Welcome to the eighth lecture of reinforcement learning. My name is Wilhelm Kirchgesner and today's topic is function approximation with supervised learning. The today's session is a little bit different. You hear it, we have a different lecturer today and the topic, the content is also going to be a little bit different. We're deviating from the red line to the scope of supervised learning, but this is going to be helpful for the later chapters of reinforcement learning. So what is the content, the table of content for this lecture? First of all, motivation and background. Why do we need supervised learning? Why can't we stay at tabular methods for reinforcement learning? What is the supervised learning problem statement? How do we conduct feature engineering? And what are the most typical machine learning models? You might remember this picture from the very first lecture where we showed you the three main pillars of machine learning. There we have unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So far, we were talking exclusively about reinforcement learning and tabular methods. Now, when we want to go over to real-world applications and real-world problems, we might need the tools from supervised learning. That's why we are going deeper into this category. So machine learning itself should know is most of the time if someone is talking about machine learning it's actually about supervised learning and it's also extensively researched and taught throughout industry and academics so for example courses at this certain university uh, university of paraborn there we have the statistical and machine learning lecture by the communications engineering department we have from the computer science department the machine learning one and two lectures but of course, outside the scope of this university, there are also online courses. For example, very popular is the Coursera machine learning course by Stanford's Andrew and the practical deep learning for coders by fast AI. I would recommend that personally and the intro material on the Kaggle platform where they have different topics to discuss. Except for that, there are of course also books, the good old medium. There we have pattern recognition and machine learning, which is a classic by M. Bishop. Um, but this actually covers only topics up to 2012. So for example, deep learning is not really a topic in this book. Except for that, we would have the elements of statistical learning by Hasty et al. And deep learning, ex especially deep learning exclusively by Ian Goodfellow, which is uh, also publicly available in the internet as an HTML. All those links here are hyperlinked, so if you click on them, you would be directly redirected to the corresponding resource. For the industry part, if you haven't heard of it before, machine learning applications are a fast-growing industry itself. As you might also know from newspaper headlines, it's uh, enhance more and more the automation is requiring it if we want to have very precise forecasts from a lot of data then most of the time industry demands machine learning applications among others popular industries are embedded systems so everywhere where hardware and software goes to go together into a real time uh, application Mobility, talking about self-driving cars and digital assistants, Alexa, Siri, and so on. These are very fast-growing industries. And all of those applications are most of the time of the supervised type. So reinforcement learning itself is still evolving, is still coming into the demand. But for now, for today, most of the time, we would be talking about supervised learning. As these industries are growing and the demand with it, there is also an increasing need in highly skilled machine learning engineers. So, so that's why machine learning is really worth your time. What are instances of machine learning applications? For example, we have recommendation systems. For example, which ads, which advertisement to display on a website which items are to be shown to a customer, for example, on Amazon, to make it likelier for him to purchase that item. Uh, forecasting is a, an important area for not only sales, but also weather, geospatial, Uber calls, restaurant, website traffic, um, 
also which items are going into the shopping cart for example so this is a big market that's why there are a lot of instances in the engineering domain we would have material attrition which would go by the buzzword predictive maintenance where we would like to forecast when some machine or item is going to fall into an outage sensors for example and all of those they are most of the time going into classification and regression we would, for example, also have speech assistance, as I said, the digital assistants, Alexa, Siri, pedestrian detection for autonomous driving, or again in the engineering domain, fault detection in engineering processes. If an item is probably not correctly manufactured in some machine, then we would like to detect that way before it is uh, brought or shipped to the customer, of course ideally during manufacturing. Um, also, that we would have chatbots, translators, DeepL, for example, or Google Translate are very popular. Credit scoring in the financial tech, fintech, it is very, it would be very nice for banks or credit card firms to know whether someone uh, independent of, of, its, of his or her heritage or ethnicity to be able to predict whether that person can pay a loan or is going to default on that so how to how to predict that that's all possible sometimes by means of statistical models which machine learning models are essentially next to that we also have generative models if you want to generate more data from data. If we have real world data collected, for example, accumulated, and we would like to produce more artificial data, which is very similar to the given data, then we would take generative models to our aid, but this is not going to be the topic in this lecture. Machine learning is, in fact, such an exciting field that there are open machine learning competitions on platforms like Kaggle or Driven Data. You just need to register there and then you could participate. The prize pools are at sometimes $1 million, so it's really worth your time. But let me tell you, it takes a lot of time to compete at the very top 100 because there is a lot of money to win. But nonetheless, it is a great resource of learning the state of the art techniques and methods for supervised learning. And recently, they also opened their first reinforcement learning competitions. So have a look there on Kaggle or Driven Data. But what does a supervised learning pipeline actually look like? Most of the time, it is uh, similar to the structure as we see here. We have uh, around six steps first data acquisition second the exploratory data anal analysis feature engineering and resampling machine learning evaluation as the fourth step machine learning optimization as the fifth step and in the end a written report and visualizations in case of a project for example with a company for a machine learning competition, so you can, for example, omit the first step data acquisition and the written report and visualizations. There it is all about techniques and data exploration. Um, most of the time, those steps are also overlapping or iterative. You wouldn't just complete the exploratory data analysis once and then never look at the data again but rather make some feature engineering, for example, some resampling, do some predictions with models, and then see that there might be something differently which is helping the models, and you would investigate on that in your Jupyter notebooks and make new plots of the data, make new explora exploration. So you would go forth and back on this, on this structure, but all of those factors you see here, they all come into play if you do supervised learning. So what is the biggest difference between supervised learning and reinforcement learning? To make it short, supervised learning approximates functions and reinforcement learning approximates policies. 
every time you need to do decisions on a sequential basis, you would take tools from reinforcement learning. And every time you need static mappings from one set of observations to another set, then you would go to supervised learning models. But those are not completely separated. They can also go together. For example, two exemplary situations where supervised learning is actually auxiliary in reinforcement learning would be the most straightforward function approximation of action state values, uh, especially if the number of possible states exceeds your RAM from your computer or any server, which is actually most of the time the case. Take, for example, chess, which has actually only a 8 times 8 board, but with all the figures and states you can have on that board that this, this is already too much for any computer to reasonably keep in memory so you would go forth and try to try to approximate the value function or action state value function with a parameterizable module where we say w is the vector of the model parameters or the trainable weight vector so to say the other case where supervised learning might be auxiliary is imitation learning. This is a method where we would try to try to model a base learner. What does that mean? Uh, for example, if we know a, a good strategy, a good policy, which is deterministic, but we would like to improve on that, but we would also want to be not worse than that base policy then we would try to do a mutation learning where we approximate the uh, the policy as if it would be a deterministic um, policy and then start from there with our usual reinforcement learning methods uh, instances of this would be for example expert moves in board games where we would show some neural network for example some good moves on a board and try to have a good initialization of that neural network then having seen those expert moves or in engineering or control of motors for example basic linear controllers where everyone knows that they are controlling the application good or well where we would try to make supervised learning on this base control controller first to to have a good initialization of the reinforcement reinforcement learning agent from where we would use as a starting point to optimize further. So how to formalize the supervised learning problem? We show you here a problem statement which goes given a labeled data set xk, yk from capital D where capital D stands for the data set with k going from 0 to capital K and k being the data set size, so small k is then the index of an observation, so to say, approximate the mapping function f to the asterisk with a parameterizable machine learning model f of w, where we would try to, to find a mapping, which is not the perfect mapping, but approximated by a model which has a finite set of parameters. In this case, a parameter, you could think of it of a float, floating point number. That would be, for example, one parameter, one, one weight in a neural network, one coefficient in a linear model. So how can we find a mapping from a set of, from a finite set of floating point numbers, so to say? That's the, the problem statement of supervised learning, where we would have different models that, that would treat their parameters differently. And if we would have a, a diverse set of models, how would we compare them with each other? Of course, mapping, finding a measure for a good map, there are a lot of different metrics where we could, where we could which we could use, for example, the most common one would be the mean squared error in a regression task or the classification accuracy during a classification task. But there are a lot more. Um, for our needs or engineering, most of the time, those would be the, the most handy ones. Um, 
one drawback of, of finding a mapping where we use a finite set of parameters is of course that the performance, the accuracy or the regression precision is degrading. It's going to be worse than the perfect mapping. But on the other hand, we do not need to store all observations in memory, which would reveal to us the perfect mapping. There is not always a firm fixed finite set of model parameters for each model. We can also have a flexible number of parameters. For example, the dimension C of model parameters omega, omega, they can be adjusted in some model families and that would trade off bias with variance. And every time you hear bias and variance, you can also think of under and overfitting. We're going to that, that topic in a few slides. Um, being able to, to adjust or adjust the topology of a model, for example, with the dimension C, that is all that is often called tuning hyperparameters. And there's not only this hyperparameter, but there might be several hyperparameters in a machine learning model that can be tuned on top of the model parameter W, which affects the performance in various ways, which is not always foreseeable in the beginning, which makes the complete, the full, the entire domain of machine learning an empirical one most of the time in contrast to other more classical domains, scientific domains. So bias and by variance, what does it actually mean? Here we have an example. It is on the left side a classification task and on the right side a regression task. On the left side, we would like to find a decision boundary. In this, in this map, in this picture, we have two boundaries, a darker green line and a bright green line, which stand for decision boundaries outputted by two different models with two different topologies. So without going into detail what models those were, we can see that the bright green line is covering perfectly almost every blue and red point where blue and red points stand for observations or samples with different classes. Red for the first class, for example, blue for the second class, and we would like to separate them as good as possible. And with the model outputting the bright green line, we would have a good accuracy on this, on this particular task or on this particular set of samples. But you could imagine if we would generate or sample more observations now, then probably that right, that bright green line is going to be too, too expressive or might not catch every other example which is coming later. Whereas the dark green line is a bit more smooth. It is not covering each blue or red point perfectly, but we could, we could estimate or forecast that future samples are probably better caught by that decision boundary than the bright, the, the bright green line. This is the difference between bias and variance. So the bright green line has a lot of variance, but no bias. That means the estimation error in the mean here for this, for this sample is, is pretty low. We have no errors here. But the variance is so high that we probably are going to miss future samples. And for the for the dark green line, we have a higher bias, so we are not covering each sample here correctly. But the variance is um, thus lower, such that we can we can be sure that for any metric later, we are probably going better with the dark green line here. On the right side, there is almost the same, the same principle. Here we are doing regression. That means we are not trying to find any decision boundary, but rather trying to fit a line into the point cloud uh, such that we are 
such that we have a, as, as a small distance from the line to the points as possible. This is the linear regression statement, for example. The dark green line here on the right side is in fact by a regression, by a linear regression, these squares. And the bright green line on the right side is done by a nearest neighbor classifier, which has some has more degrees of freedom, as you can see. It, it is uh, with higher variance. It is probably also covering those points a little better than just the straight line. But this is only true for this exact snapshot of observations. If there are going to be future future observations, they are probably not not lying very good over the bright green line, but they would be they would be closer to the dark green line. From these two toy examples, you might already realize that we cannot report the model accuracy on data the model was actually fit on. We cannot report that metric because then we would be able to increase the parameter size arbitrarily, reduce the bias to zero, and end up with a very, very high variance, which gives us a perfect score with a uh, apparently perfect model. But that's not what we want. We want a model which is going to generalize as good as possible. And that's why we need to formalize the performance of, of a supervised learning model by its generalization error on unseen data. So that means data it was not fit on, it wasn't being trained with. But how do we get unseen data after training? This is in contrast to reinforcement learning environments where we would generate our observations arbitrarily and sometimes also infinitely. Where in supervised learning tasks, we most of the time have a finite data set. So how do we get more data for validation? We can't. That's why we need to hold out portions of the data set for cross-validation. How does that work? One possible option is k-fold cross-validation. How does that work? So you take your data set and you split it first into two parts, the training set here in green and the test set in blue. The error on that test set is going to be our generalization error and all errors conducted or found within the training set are going to be our validation error. So during cross fold cross during k fold cross validation, in this case k is five, we are repeating the training five times with five different splits of the training set. So imagine fold one here representing the first twenty percent of your data, the twenty the twenty the first twenty percent of your samples, which are serve, serving as test or validation set, which are hold out during training, whereas the remaining 80% are used for training in this iteration. In the second iteration, we are initializing the model completely. So we are wiping off all experience or memory, which was generated during the first split and repeat training. But now fold two is going to be the test set and the other folds are used for training. So we can report then the performance on fold one as the test set, then performance on fold two as the test set, fold three, four, and five, and so on. And, and we end up with five different uh, performance measures, which we would average then in order to get the validation error. So far, so good. If your model has no hyperparameters, then the validation error is actually a pretty good uh, metric to report on generalization error. But most of the time you're going to have a, a model with some degrees of freedom, with some flexibility, where you can tune hyperparameters, that is the topology of the model, for example, the exit, the exact learning rate of the optimizer on that model and so forth. So you can tune your model and repeat the k-fold cross-validation over and over 
until you are satisfied with the validation error or until it is very, very low. But then there is a fundamental problem with reporting the validation error as generalization error because you have actually tweaked your model to be good at this cross validation method, which is too optimistic for a true generalization error. And that's why we have also the test set here, which was not part of the hyperparameter optimization during the cross fold, uh, during the k fold cross validation, but is hold out through the entire process in order to report the error on that set as generalization error after having optimized hyperparameters with the validation error. So with this technique, we make sure that each observation serves as unseen instance at least once. We could also have k as 10, for example, if we would have a finer granular cross-validation technique, but the down, downside is that we have to repeat training, of course, with each fold. So after having set up a good cross-validation technique, how do we actually improve a machine learning model on a certain performance metric? First of all, the obvious way is to collect more data. That means increasing capital K because you can remember that more data is always better. Why is that so? Since machine learning models are in essence statistical models, they are trying to infer statistics from the data and try to, to make sense from patterns they see in the data. And the more samples we have in our, in our sample, in our, in our data set, the, the more robust and the more certain a machine learning model can be that they have seen a strong predictive pattern in the data, which is not just a statistical fluctuation. So having more data is always better. The other technique would be to choose a different model than before. For example, if there are patterns which are predictive in your data set in order to estimate the dependent variable, which is your target variable, then it might be that those patterns are, for example, non-linear in the regressor with respect to the target, where a linear regression would be then uh, not suitable. So choosing completely different models might be helpful. Another way is optimizing hyperparameters, of course, of a model, tuning the topology, tuning the way it is trained on the, on the data set. This is, this is most of the time also of, of some help, but not necessarily going to make a linear model, for example, suddenly predict targets with non-linear dependencies to regressors. That's not going to bring you there. A popular technique in some machine learning competitions is to average over several different models, which is going by the term ensembling, because since machine learning models are statistical, and you, if you train several different of them, they all have a slightly different opinion of the target, for example, at each, at each single sample, which is sometimes a little bit below, sometimes a little bit over the actual target. So average, averaging over them is surprisingly helpful, even though there is not always a theoretical ground for why one should do this, but this is most of the time very helpful. Of course, you're increasing your memory demand than if you have several models doing the same thing. But the most effective measure to improving a machine learning model is by revealing the most predictive patterns in the data to the model through feature engineering. And feature engineering, that's the next topic, which is sometimes neglected, by practitioners of machine learning, but actually it, it is actually more helpful than tuning hyperparameters infinitely or trying completely different models, which are all not really suitable. Feature engineering most of the time gives you the most bang for your buck. Feature engineering means simply to add more representations of the data to the data set. Those representations can come from the real world, 
via additional sensors, for example, or through additional tracking mechanisms on a website, for example, that's tracking more click behavior or other user patterns. They could be hand designed or engineered by experts, experts in the corresponding domain from the original feature set. We will see later how that actually works. Or they could be built according to properties of each feature automatically from the original set without any prior exploratory data analysis or similar. But please be aware, I've said before that more data is always better, but that pertains to the sample size capital K, not to more features that are generated from the original feature set. Because uh, if we have a fixed data set size, and imagine we are adding arbitrarily many features for, by some system or by some external ideas, how to make new representations. If we continue to do that and end up with a lot of different representations of the data, we are increasing essentially the chance to align statistical fluctuations in those new features with our target variable yk, which would lead to overfitting. Because any model would then think, oh, I see a very high linear correlation, for example, with that new feature that we just generated with my actual target. That means this new feature is the perfect predictor, the perfect feature. I don't need any other features to predict my target. It would completely rely on this new representation. And then later, when on the, in the field, in the production, there are going to come new new future samples which are not completely the same as the training set for of course then we would see that we have a very very uh, very very bad performance and that's then the outcome of overfitting so always be cautious if you add more features especially if you're adding a lot of them and your data size is pretty small how does feature engineering looks like for example, here an classification task. Uh, we have on the left side the original distribution or the original scatter of a sample. In red, there is one class. In blue, that's the second class. We want to this, we want to separate them again with a decision boundary, ideally. So if we, for example, think of the x-axis as the width and the y-axis as the height. Then we could think of a new feature, which is the r variable, which is just the, the radius from the center. When we say the origin is directly in the center of that cloud, of that blob. And a second new feature is the theta, which is the r cos tangents of the height over the width they would reveal a linearly separable class distribution as you can see here on the right side. So we could even put a linear decision boundary here and have the almost perfect separation, which wouldn't be possible here on the left side with the circular decision boundary. A similar thing can be shown with regression. For example, here on the left side, we have the original scatter of the data in green, and we would try to to model those sc the scatter with a line. That's not possible with a straight line. That is that, that's not possible with a linear model. But if we take the log transform of the target signal of the green scatter points, then we can see that a yellow straight line better fits into the point cloud here and the distance is minimized. Before we can apply any model to the data, most of the time we would need to conduct normalization or standardization on the data. That means we have to put every feature representation into a coherent scale, which is done probably by doing a standard scaling where we would subtract the average of a feature and divide by its standard deviation such that each feature ends up with a zero mean and unit standard deviation of one or we could do it with a min max scaling for example where we would subtract the minimum of the feature 
distribution and divide by the maximum minus the minimum, which where we would end up with features that all have their minimum value at zero and their maximum value at one. If we would not unnormal, if we would not normalize the data, then we would have very likely features that have a far higher scale or magnitude than other features, such that patterns in those features with a very small scale are going to be negligible to most of the models, which are not tree-based in fact, such that even though they might be predictive, they would look like they have no defect. Moreover, you should know that there are several different data types which, which need to be normalized differently. If we go through them one by one, first of all, we have binary features. That's the most straightforward one. Something is either true or false, one or zero, male or female, whatsoever. We have integer data types, for example, the number of rooms in a building, the hour of the day, for example. We have the real valued features, which are, for example, temperatures or anything which is uh, continuous valued. Then we have categorical features, which are, for example, colors, blue, green, red, or anything which has no ordering with respect to other data types, countries, for example, cities, postal codes, they have no, no natural order. And then we have ordinal data types, which are in, in essence categoricals that can be ordered, for example, educational experience from elementary school to PhD. How would we normalize categorical data? For ordinal data, it is straightforward. We would do the so-called label encoding where we would replace the categories with integers which are also order we can order them on the other hand how do we treat categoricals which cannot be ordered we would for example have the possibility to do one hot encoding there we would replace a categorical of n values with n binary features so we are increasing the feature space on the other hand, the feature space gets sparse when we do this. And if the categorical would, for example, have thousand different categories, thousand different values, you can think of products in Amazon. There would be a lot of products. You cannot always order them with each other. How would you put them? How would you normalize this? You wouldn't be able to one hot encoding in this case because you would end up with millions or billions of columns in your data set which would not fit into RAM and is zero most of the time anyway. A, an alternative would be mean target encoding where we would replace each value of a category, categorical with the average during regression or the mode in terms of classification of the dependent variable being observed with the corresponding value. So that means if we want to encode the product shampoo, for example, if we want to encode that, we would, we would collect all observations with the product shampoo, see what's the price. If we say the price is the target, we would like to predict. We average that and the mean, the mean of this price is going to be the new value every time we see shampoo. That would be the mean target encoding. Um, on the downside, this might lead to information leakage. That means the target information is leaking from the dependent variable into the independent variable such that we would see a high performance using those mean target encoded variables. But that would be actually just one form of overfitting. This is not always the case, but that can happen. A more sophisticated way to normalized categorical data, categorical data would be by entity embeddings. This is a bit more intricate because we would need to use a neural network to find an encoding, which is of course a bit more complicated because before we do machine learning, we're already doing machine learning to find the right features. But um, 
it depends on the application. Sometimes that might be justifiable, sometimes not. For example, in embedded systems, that would be probably too much computational load. But for competitions, that is actually a very popular choice. Giving you concrete instances of feature engineering, the most popular ones are most of the time of the following scheme. So first of all, imagine you would have k feature vectors with p capital P equal 3. That means we have two real valued regressors and one categorical independent variable, xk is then a vector of three values, two continuously valued values and a categorical, categorical. The most straightforward version of a feature engineered, feature engineered feature would be then just to do, for example, the addition of the two real valued features, xk r1 plus xk r2, or the subtraction, product, division, anything possible. You can also add not only two values or features, but many differently, many different values together. There are a lot of degrees of freedom. You could also take another normalization of the regressor values with respect to the categorical. So the mathematical equation is a bit unintuitive, but what you actually do is very similar to the mean target encoding. You you calculate the mean of some observation in terms in terms of its category, categorical value within its group, within its category. You calculate the mean of that regressor and subtract that. So similar to mean target encoding, but you would use that as a new feature then. Then another way is just to clip or drop features or aggregate them such that some outliers are vanishing. Outliers are a big problem for a lot of models. So if you just drop outliers, that is helping a lot sometimes to get a more robust model to, to reduce the variance in it. You could do coordinate transformations for spatial features, for example, rotation, similar to the example we have shown earlier. You can do, you can create lag features, moving averages for data in the time domain. This is not always the case. Sometimes you have just data which is independent from each other. But in engineering, we all, we often have timely depending observations one after the other, which is a time series, for example, weather data, temperature data over time. So adding just the last observation or the penultimate estimation, this is sometimes also helping to get a prediction, which is informed by the past, but is still done by a model which actually assumes independent and identically distributed data. We will see what that means later. And moving averages helps to, to see the trend in the data similar to stock exchange predictions. In frequency domain, we can calculate the amplitude and the index of frequencies from a fast Fourier transform if the computational load is allowing for that, but you, you get the hang of it. Having talked about the fundamentals of data science or machine learning, we can go over to the topic of machine learning models how they are structured, how they work, what their parameters look like, and how we can train them. Of course, this one lecture is not enough to explain those models and all their principles in detail. I recommend the statistical machine learning lecture, for example, by the communications engineering department for a more in-depth um, contemplation. But nonetheless, in this lecture, we would like to explain in a brief overview the, the fundamentals of the most prevalent models, or models which are most of the time probably the, the preferred models because of their performance. 
But first, a few words to the model landscape. So there is a variety of models you can choose from. The most simplest one is the linear or logistic regression, also with regularization. This is the simplest data fitting algorithm. It has the fewest amount of parameters, but as the name suggests, it only models linear dependencies very well. There are support vector machines. You might have heard, you might have heard of it. It was very popular before 2012, before deep learning was there. Um, but yeah, nowadays they're not used that much anymore. Talking about deep neural networks, this is, this has soared in popularity since 2012, also coined as deep learning. What is deep learning? It's actually, it's just the use of neural networks with several hidden layers. Um, actually deep learning pertains to a number of layers of over 10 or sometimes 100. It's actually arbitrary, arbitrary. Um, so deep learning is in essence a subcomponent of supervised learning or machine learning. Uh, the most prevalent domains or where the, the biggest successes were celebrated in the past were natural language processing, NLP, and image processing. Next to that, there is also another type of map models, the gradient boosting machines, where we would chain weak models together. Most of the time that would be, the weak model would be a decision tree. And they are so important because they are the best performing standalone model in most tabular machine learning competitions. We should not neglect gradient boosting machines, even though they are neglected in a lot of course material, in a lot of lectures throughout the academic world. But we nonetheless would like to talk a little bit how they work because the potential is very high here. Now, if you see this spectrum of models, one could be tempted to always use the the most expressive model for any task, for example, do deep neural networks for anything. But choosing do deep neural networks for any problem, as as simple as it might be, would trans would transfer to the following metaphor, where you would use a big model with a lot of parameters on something where a simple linear regression might have been sufficient. And the outcome would be that either you have a good performance in terms of a small metric, a small error, but your model is 10 times as big as it need to be. And the other possible outcome is that you might have a bad performance with a deep neural network because there were too many parameters to tweak actually to get the right the right setting to have a good performance, even though a far simpler model would have achieved a far better performance in a fraction of time. Now let's get a bit more technical. Starting off with linear regression. A linear regression is characterized by a linear model. That means the prediction yk, y hat k, is a linear combination of all the features we are exposing to the linear model. Each feature is represented by xk and is enumerated from 1 to capital P. So there is a coefficient w associated with each feature plus an offset term w0. If we append the feature vector with a 1 in the beginning, we can even boil this formulation down to equation 2.2, which is in matrix notation and very compact. How do we determine the parameter vector w? There are several methods, but the most popular one is by minimizing the residual sum of squares, RSS, which is also called the least squares method where we try to minimize the squared distance between each scatter point to the line we try to fit into the point cloud. Taking equation 2.3 now and trying to find a minimum there, 
we will see that we can end up with a analytically closed solution form equation 2.4 here. Be aware that there is a matrix inversion which can lead to numerical imprecision or problems. Having a, an analytically closed solution form is very beneficial as we do not need to start any lengthy iterative optimization problem. We would be finding the solution after a short time of calculation just by adding all observations there are in the data set. Be aware though that if we have multi collinearity in the data set between features, there might be a problem with indeterministically feature growth or coefficient growth. This means if two features are very similar or highly linearly correlated, then the corresponding coefficients might get the one might get a very large real valued number and the other one a very small real valued number which can grow indefinitely as they are erasing themselves out in order to overcome this there are also methods that add regularization such as lasso and rich where we would add the l1 norm to the cost to the residual sum of squares or the l2 norm of the parameters w to the residual sum of squares such that we would introduce some bias but reduce variance where we would end up with a better performance or better fit and we are not as uh, susceptible to outliers than before. Linear regression is the simplest and most lightweight model out there in terms of machine learning and should therefore be preferred in any application in case the achieved performance is sufficient for one needs. A lot of real world tasks out there are in fact solvable by linear regression already, such that this method, this model should not be neglected. On the other hand, when you face problems there where no linear dependency exists between the dependent and independent variables, then one needs to shift over to nonlinear models. Among the most popular ones are artificial neural networks. Artificial neural networks are just nonlinear models that are end-to-end -end differentiable. We will see later what that means. What does a neural network look like, a artificial neural network? Typically, it consists of a set of nodes distributed over a set of layers. On the left side, on figure 2.9, you see an exemplary node, which consists of a set of inputs, a set of weights connected with those inputs that go together into a summation block. That sum is then squished through an activation function, becoming the ultimately output Y. A, such a node or neuron is uh, available in each layer. So multiple neurons make up a, a layer and we can have arbitrarily many layers in a neural network, which is essentially a hyperparameter then. So to, to give you an example how that works, imagine at x1, there is a real val valued number three, for example, and for the edge w1, we have a value five, for example, then 3 times 5 makes 15 in the, on the left side of that summation block for this arrow, for this edge. And then for x2, we could have a number 8. For w2, we could have the parameter minus 2, which, end, which would end up to a value minus 16 for that edge here on the summation block. Continuing that for all edges. Summing them together, we would end up with some value, and that is again transformed by the activation function, which we will see later what they look like, making the output y for that specific neuron. So that means each node transforms 
the weighted sum of all previous nodes through that activation function. And the weighted connections are often called edges, edges or just weights, which make up the complete parameter set of the artificial neural network. What does a complete neural network look like then? We would start off with the multilayer perceptron, which is the most basic form of a artificial neural network. It was coined initially multilayer perceptron, but it is also often known as feed forward artificial neural network in order to emphasize the difference to more sophisticated architectures. For the multilayer perceptron or MLP, we just have only forward flowing edges. So we have only edges going from the input here at the bottom of the figure going up, propagating through many layers of neurons to the end layer capital L. There are no connections that are going backwards to the bottom, which would be the case for recurrent neural networks, for example. And we are always assuming that we have simple neurons, nothing complicated, as we will see later, what's, what's also out there. Just imagine, just keep in mind that for each layer or for each transition from one layer to the next, there are a certain set of parameters associated with capital, capital W and B for bias. So what are the hyperparameters in here? You could probably also already imagine that the depth of the neural network, which is the number of layers, is a degree of freedom. The width h is a hyperparameter. That means how many neurons do we want to have in each layer? This is completely arbitrary. Also the activation function and the activation of a layer respectively. So we have then for the complete mathematical notation of a neural network, the following equation, capital H is the output of the activation function phi taken on the activation H of the last layer L minus one times capital or capital uh, w plus the bias from that current layer so the exponential here is not really an exponential but rather an index for the layer we are currently at emphasized by the parentheses what are the shapes like so the weight matrix capital w is an h to the l minus one times h to the l matrix or tensor and b is a actually a vector but for our calculations it is broadcast broadcasted into a matrix k times h to the l such that we came come up with the correct shape we will later see an example of how those shapes look like and they make up the complete parameter set of the neural network if you take all w's and all b's for each layer they they together make the parameter weights of the artificial neural network. Usually, these are there is no analytically closed solution form. We have to optimize them iteratively. We will see also how that works. Maybe a few words to the activation functions first. So there is a, a certain set of activation functions that are usually used. In the beginning of the deep learning research, there were most of the time the tangents hyperbolicals and the sigmoid activation function. Later, they also introduced the so-called rectified linear unit, which is also which is actually not squishing the activation of a layer anymore, but is on the other hand uh, easier to compute since it's only zero or for the actual activation. Even though there is actually no, no real derivative in the origin of the rectified linear unit, this is usually not posing any problems during training of a neural network. Um, 
These are the activation functions you would use in intermediate layers, which are also often called hidden layers in, in contrast to the input layer and the output layer. Whereas for the last layer, the output layer, which in our notation is phi to the capital L, this one is usually task dependent. So for a regression task, we would have the identity function as a activation function. For binary classification, we would also take sigmoid. That one is going from zero to one. And for multi-class classification, we would use a more intricate activation function, which is the softmax activation function, as you can see at the bottom. This one is just making sure that we have for each class a revalued number going from zero to one. So how do we train neural networks? Usually we would use a gradient descent method. Most of the time a stochastic gradient descent method, SGD, and the update formulas for those are stated here. You might recognize those update rules from previous reinforcement learning lectures where we had something similar for the update rules of the value functions. So it is, it is also pretty similar. We update each weight or weight parameter by subtracting from the original or previous weight uh, a certain a certain value calculated times a step size alpha, whereas now the value we multiply with the step size is not the difference between value functions anymore. Here it is the gradient of the of our actual position on a cost landscape. So the cost L needs to be defined and is often called the loss between ground truth y and the estimation vector y hat. And uh, this is often uh, easily calculated, calculatable. The definition of a cost function is also task dependent. For regression, we would usually use the mean squared error MSE or the root mean squared error RMSE or the mean absolute error, whatever makes the most sense in that specific application. And for classification, we would use the cross entropy cost, which is not arbitrary, but it was specifically chosen in order to make the stochastic gradient descent calculation easier. Since it's a an iterative process, an iterative optimization process, we would take several iterations over the complete data set D, whereas each iteration would be called epoch. When conducting gradient descent, one could choose between a few options. So the most straightforward ways would be the batch gradient descent or the stochastic gradient descent. What's the difference? For batch gradient descent, we would average the gradients over all samples we have in our data set. And then after calculating the gradients on them, update the weights, the parameters of the neural network. Whereas for the stochastic gradient descent, we would update the weights directly after observing each sample in the data set. So if we look at the error landscape here on the left side, the difference between both methods would be that for batch gradient descent, we have a more robust path in dark green, whereas the stochastic gradient descent, it will see a slightly different error landscape than we see here in this picture and thus making steps which are a bit more random. That's why it's called stochastic gradient descent. But most of the time in the end, it would also find the same minimum. So why would we use stochastic gradient descent then if it is not as robust as batch gradient descent? The reason is that if you have a large data set, batch gradient descent might not be computational tractable. So the more efficient SGD is then chosen usually um, even, even, even more specifically, uh, nowadays we would use a mix of SGD and BGD, which is called a mini batch gradient descent, then where we would take batches of 
something like 32 samples, 64, 128, or maybe a bit, a bit more samples into one batch and uh, calculate the gradient then on each of the samples in one batch and average over them before update, updating the parameter weights. So now diving deeper into how the training actually works, we would retrieve the gradients by the chain rule for vector derivatives. You could recall from the calculus class that the derivative of a vector, which is the function of another vector, whereas here z is also a function of y, we could rewrite the derivative of the scalar with respect to a vector by the product of a Jacobian here of g times the gradient of z with respect to y and write this into a summation notation. So this is in terms of a vector calculating the derivative of a scalar with respect to a vector which is also a, a function of a vector. We could we could enroll this also to matrices, tensors, not only to vectors. When we assume that we enumerate each element of the tensor consecutively and then just loop through them, writing them into that summation notation. This is a very powerful trick to calculate arbitrary derivatives of arbitrary shapes from tensors of arbitrary shape. Now specifically using this tool, we can conduct the error backpropagation training method. That means we are taking a forward step through the network from the bottom to the top, calculating all the outputs of the neurons and layers. And having done that, we can make a backward step then in which the gradients theta of the loss L is computed with respect to the neural network's parameters from the output layer back to the input layer. Having the gradients, we know how much we should change or alter the parameters in each layer and each neuron. At this point, I would like to emphasize that arrow backpropagation with its forward step and backward step is actually a special case of the more general automatic differentiation, also known as autodiff or algorithmic differentiation. Autodiff is a complete standalone alternative to symbolic differentiation and numerical differentiation. It is not the same, it has clear differences. And with autodiff, one is able to make precise gradients or derivatives of arbitrary computer routines or functions. The interested student should read up on this topic. Very interesting. Now having a look at the error propagation pseudocode. First, we initialize H at the very first layer, layer zero, with the input vectors, the feature vectors. And from there, we propagate forward to the last layer. That means for L of one to capital A, L. We are going through our usual equation that we have seen before, calculating the activation capital Z, uh, squishing that with the activation function, getting the output of that layer capital H. Doing that for all layers, we will have the activations at each point in the neural network. And from there, we can start with the backward propagation. The backward propagation includes calculating the gradient, at several points. And cal calculating the gradient also involves to derive the activation functions, whatever activation function we are using. So here it is just generally printed with a delta of the partial derivative of phi to the L. But as it is, it, as it stands here, this one is very dependent on how the activation function actually looks like. We will have a, we will have an example in the next slide. Uh, it is just important for you to understand that for the forward propagation, we were going from layer one to layer L, capital L. And for the backward propagation, we're going from layer capital L backwards to capital, uh, to layer one and derive 
all the gradients for the weight parameters one by one from top to bottom. Now this looks maybe a little bit intriguing. That's why we have a look at an example now. Assume we have a very small feature vector of three entries. One observation is then, for example, 257, and the corresponding target value is a revalued one, y0, with the value 2.5. And we want to make one training iteration with a two layered artificial neural network with the mean squared error cost, since we're doing regression here. And the activation function in the intermediate layer, the hidden layer, is the sigmoid activation function sigma of z, which has this form. The hidden layer is specified with having two neurons with the output h to the 1, while the weight vectors are then correspondingly initialized with the following values. Please note that here the first weight parameter W is a 3 times 2 matrix, 3 because of 3 entries in X, and 2 because of the 2 neurons. The first bias vector is correspondingly initialized with 2 random values for the 2 neurons. And then for the next weight vector W, we have only 2 entries, 2 because the on the input side we have the two neurons and one because on the output side there is only one dependent variable, one output neuron. The bias is then correspondingly only one entry because the output is only one entry. If we apply stochastic gradient descent, we would start with the forward propagation. We are computing the activation after this equation getting a certain value after also squishing it through the sigmoid function. And this is for the output of the first layer. Doing that for, this, for the output layer, we will end up with one single value, 0 0.198, which is uh, relatively close to the actual target. But still, there is an error which needs now to be backpropagated. We do this with the backward step, where we note that the derivative of the sigmoid function is just the sigmoid function again times 1 minus the sigmoid function. Very interesting. And we then go just step by step from top to, to bottom. We are calculating the mean squared error here, or the gradient of the mean squared error. That's an easy one. We take the exponential 2 to in before the parentheses and get a value, a specific value, minus 4.6. We go over to calculate the element-wise multiplication here to get the gradient for the bias in the output layer, B2. Um, we do next calculation to get the gradient for the W, w array, which is also an array. Repeating that for the um, previous layer, going down, and we see that also the the shapes of the gradients are always equal to the shape of the actual weight parameters. So the gradient to b to the one is also just a vector with two entries. The gradient to w to the one has also a shape of 3 times 2 and equals to the actual shape of the w vector. This is necessary in order to actually com compute the update step then, as you remember, is just the previous weight vector minus alpha, the step size, times the gradient. So this is an example for one, for one observation out of all samples in the data set. And this is essentially done then for each sample in the data set, not only once, but as often as we determined to have epochs in this training.
When should we stop this training? Usually one would say after a certain amount of epochs we would stop training or after there is no improvement in the achieved performance in the error after a certain number of epochs. A few words to weight initialization. Uh, actually, this was thought to be trivial to just set zero for all weights and all biases. But it was found that this is actually not leading to any auspicious training outcomes. And it has been found that a, a better initialization scheme would be to have either a uniform or normal distribution of the weights, but also not with a certain zero mean and unit standard deviation, which is often the case, but rather uh, with distributions or limits which are determined by the previous amount of neurons in the previous layer and the actual output size or number of outputs, number of neurons in the actual layer. So having initializations dependent on the neurons in the previous and next layer helps to get a more, more auspicious training later. Also, please note, in case, in case that's not understood so far, please note that since we are doing stochastic gradient descent or an iterative training process, the initialization of the weight parameters leads to the, leads to different starting points on the error landscape, such that the repeated training of a neural network with, with repeated initialization would probably also lead to different local minimum points because we had different starting points in the error landscape. So this is a classic classic case for local optimization in highly nonlinear parameter spaces at random starting points. Similar to our k nearest neighbor example in the beginning, we can also increase the overall parameter size of the neural network by adding more and more hidden layers, by adding more and more neurons per layer which is increasing the expressiveness of the neural network, but also might lead to overfitting. There are means to reduce overfitting though. Among others, we would have the possibility to regularize neural network weights by either weight decay. That means we're also adding an L2 penalty term to the weights similar to rich regression for linear regression. We could do layer normalization during training where all layer activations are normalized by a standard scaling separately. So for each layer, we are doing standard scaling again during training, but not during inference. Or very popular is the so-called dropout method where we randomly disable a few nodes contribution or a certain fraction of nodes are disabled which helps especially in deep networks. That means if you have a lot of hidden layers and this effective, effectively builds an ensemble of artificial neural networks with shared edges. If you imagine that each dropout version, dropped out version of the neural network stands for a single neural network with a certain topology and we are doing that repeatedly. In the end, they all are adding up to an ensemble with one prediction where each topology is a little bit different, but the parameters are the same with their, with their own certain index. Um, next to regularization for MLPs, there are also other topologies, advanced topologies for neural networks, which are schemed here. Um, so far, the multilayer perceptron assumes IID data, that means identical, uh, independent and identically distributed data. So it does not assume that there is a timely dependency between subsequent observations, which is the case, of course, for time series data. And there are topologies that try to exploit this dependency, for example, recurrent neural networks here on the left where we have also recurring edges going from the output of one neuron to the input of that neuron again, also associated with one certain weight and also trainable. And on the right side, we have a, an example of a one-dimensional convolutional neural network 
where we do not have recursive connections, but we would have the uh, we would have filters slided through the time series from left to right. So here you see on the bottom you see one filter with four edges or a kernel size of four, and that one is slided through a time window through a certain time window here. Slide it from left to right. Each edge in this filter in this kernel has a certain weight, and sliding that kernel through the time series is leading to corresponding values in the intermediate layer. Doing that with another learnable kernel in the next layer, which has a ex expanding expanding filter size. This is also called to be a dilated convolutional kernel then because the distance between these edges is increasing with each layer. This kernel is again associated with four different weights and shifted through that time window. Uh, this all leads up to one single prediction and essentially exploits the time development, the time progress in the time series. Uh, also, please note that if you want to do real-time prediction, then this convolutional convolutional neural network is a causal one. That means we are not using any future observations for the actual prediction. So far, an outlook to advanced topologies. We are not diving deeper into this topic. Again, if you want to learn more about these topics, I can recommend the Statistical Machine Learning course by the Communications Engineering Department. We are going over to the last model for today, the gradient boosting machines. A gradient boosting machine consists of M, capital M, additive chained weak learners, C of C where each learner tries to minimize the whole ensemble's overall loss, L of ground truth and prediction, given the preceding ensemble of Y hat sub M minus one. So the index M minus one or M stands for the number of weak learners we have in the current ensemble leading to that prediction Y hat. The update rule here is also presented with the ensemble, the prediction of ensemble with m weak le learners is just the ensemble of the, it's just the prediction of the previous ensemble plus the additional weak learner c sub m of c, which is just the, just the prediction of all weak learners in the full ensemble. A weak learner is most of the time it is a decision tree with a, a limited depth sometimes or most often less than 10 and uh, instead of optimizing the the real uh, real value parameters like in a neural network or in a linear regression here we are not optimizing those weight parameters but rather functions c so how should the next week learner look like from its topology point of we point of view and other hyperparameters we will see later. So this is not an iterative optimization, but an additive optimization. On the right side, you see a exemplary decision tree with two regressors, XR1 and XR2, trying to do a classification where Y is either zero or one. And you see here, this decision tree was grown into at maximum four levels or three. Uh, if XR1 is greater than, for example, 0 0.5, then we are branching to the left arrow. If it is false, if this condition is false, we are branching to the right arrow. There we again have some conditions to check for, for the values in our features. Depending on that, depending on whether that's true or false, we are again branching left and right, leading to the so-called leaves in this decision tree, which are just the endpoints of the complete decision tree. When we train a gradient boosting machine, we are also calling this boosting. So how do we boost a tree ensemble? First, again, we need a minimization objective. Here it is called JM for growing trees at the nth boosting round. So at the nth 
uh, and weak learner. And uh, this one is shown here in equation 2.11. So the cost is again with L described between the ground truth Y and the prediction, whereas the prediction is described here by the prediction of the previous ensemble plus the new weak learner, where we need to still define how that new weak learner Psi of Psi looks like. We can expand this with the Taylor expansion to the second order approximation, which looks like this, where tau, tau prime and tau double prime are now representing the gradients of the cost, the first order gradient and the second order gradient of the cost. And if we would like to remove this, if we would like to optimize this, we can remove the constant part here in the, in the beginning, such that we end up just with the tau parts and come up with the following form here in equation 2.12. Now this reduced cost function is not helping us with defining how C should look like, C of M, C sub M. We first need to reformulate that into a, into a form where we can infer the topology of the new weak learner. How do we do that? First, we need to uh, abstract the search a little bit. So consider a single tree with capital N leaves be defined as a vector of leaf scores C sub M of X equal W sub S of X, where W is a N element vector, S is a mapping function, mapping from the number of features in a vector with capital P elements to a index which is enumerated just from 1 to n. That means S is a function that maps each observation to one of the capital N indices where these indices are the indices of the leaves of the tree. We still don't know how many leaves there are and we still don't know how to map those observations to those indices, those leaves. So if we also add the notation of capital I sub N, which is the set of, of, set of observations in leaf N, then we can regroup the objective by each leaf. That means equation 2.12 can be reformulated into this form, where we have the summations over the set of observations in each leaf, which at first glance might not help us in any way, but with a more deeper look, we can see that this is now a sum of single variable quadratic functions. And for this form, we can easily see the, the optimum, or we can easily optimize this, since the optimum weights, Wn, would then be just minus capital T prime sub K over capital T double prime sub K. The corresponding cost looks like then here on the right side, but this is not giving us the optimal solution directly since we assumed a fixed tree structure, which we do not have yet. So in order to find the best split of the, in the value range, we have to make a greedy search. So the greedy best split search is determined by uh, finding the or minimizing the objective, which is the gain, the so-called gain. The gain is just the cost of a potential left child, the cost of a potential right child in the tree, minus the cost of making no split in here. And if we compute that gain for uh, certain values along the range, the value range of each feature, we can compute whether the gain is improving or not and whether we should make a split or not. Doing that repeatedly, we would add week, one week learner at a time additively and end up with a certain week learner, which is added to the ensemble, essentially increasing the ensemble um, when do we stop doing this? There's actually, that's the same problem as we had with the iterative training of the neural network. When should we stop? When are we starting to overfit? There are also similar 
heuristics where we would, for example, look at the a validation error. Is it still is it still decreasing or does it start to increase uh, in a certain cross validation scheme? Is is it improving for a certain set of iterations or is it stagnating? Are we in a plateau or not? These are the methods we would would apply here in order to find the best moment to stop this additive training. So the method alone is not actually the reason why gradient boosting machines are so popular. It actually got so so renowned because there was a fast and scalable and cache aware implementation which was provided by implementations or toolboxes like XGBoost, LightGBM by Microsoft, or CatBoost for categorical boost. They were very easy to use and they delivered very good results in a diverse set of problems and tasks very fast, which made them the, the model of choice in a lot of competitions. And they also won a lot of competitions as a single model, which is actually pretty remarkable. Um, there's of course more details to the training or to the to the definition of a new weak learner you can also apply tree constraints constraints for example how big should one weak learner be at maximum how how big is the depth of each learner how many leaves should be there per per decision tree and so on and so forth there are actually even more hyperparameters in a gradient boosting machine than in a neural network we can also have weight decay that is adding L2 penalty to the cost, random sampling column wise and row wise when we are looking for the best split, and learning rates for each additional tree can also be added. So far, so good for the gradient boosting machines. Um, before we end this lecture, a few words to hyperparameter optimization in general. There are usually uh, several levels of inference during hyperparameter optimization. At the very first level, at the bottom, we would have the usual training of our models automated by gradient descent or by the additive training scheme we had for gradient boosting machines. There can, there can be also meta heuristics, for example, particle swarm optimization or genetic algorithms. Um, but on top of that, we have learned that there are hyperparameters, right? So how do we how do we tune those? We could do that manually, but more systematic would be to do that automated on the second level of inference by tools like Bayesian search or also meta heuristics like particle swarm optimization, genetic algorithms. That takes, of course, more time because in each iteration of the hyperparameter optimization, several runs of the first level of inference might need to be ran because of statistical scatter and fluctuations. That's a timely process, but it is still worth to be done because there is the potential chance to inc increase the performance or improve the performance of a machine le learning model by hyperparameter optimization. But there's also a third level of inference here on top, which is which are things like the choice of framework. Are we using are we using TensorFlow? Are we using PyTorch for neural networks? What software are we using? The intervals for hyperparameters. Are we going to optimize between one layer and ten layers in a neural network, or between five layers and one hundred layers? Those intervals need to be chosen. They could be also automated. Automated, of course, but this would be then even more time consuming. And this not feasible usually. If you go forth and do hyperparameter optimization, you can do this with a certain set of toolboxes. Um, be aware though that it takes a lot of time. You could run also into local minima instead of global, global minima. The same problem as for the usual landscape, error landscape for training a, a model without hyperparameters. Um, we recommend toolboxes like HyperOpt, Scikit Optimize, or PySwarm for Python for doing the usual hyperparameter optimization in the most prevalent models.
Besides that, of course, there are also more toolboxes we would recommend. For example, for deep learning, there is TensorFlow 2 and its high-level API Keras. PyTorch is pretty performant. Chainer and CNTK can also be mentioned. There are even more pedal pedal and so on, but you would need to find yourself what is more appealing to you. And these are just the biggest with the biggest community and therefore also battle proven. For gradient boosting machines, I have mentioned them already. There is XGBoost, LightGBM, and CatBoost, uh, with more and more coming. Whereas for linear models, tree based models, and memory based models like uh, K nearest neighbors, support vector machines, and so on, there's a lot more. You can find all of them in the Scikit Learn toolbox, which is a really good toolbox, pretty well documented with a lot of with a lot of fundamentals explained again so i can really recommend that toolbox to start with as well so this lecture comes to an end now the summary is that the following things should be addressed here first the industry has a high demand for machine learning applications the demand is growing and growing and so is the demand for skilled machine learning engineers um, higher bias traits of variance for a better overall score. So that means a model with zero bias is not necessarily the best model you can have in terms of generalization error. You've learned how to cross-validate and improve a supervised learning model and what's the importance of cross-validation. You've learned how new features can be engineered, generated or created, how they are normalized and what they are good for. And you'll learn the fundamentals of linear regression, neural networks, and gradient boosted trees or gradient boosting machines. The most important models, in our opinion, for engineering and similar tasks in the broad domain of machine learning. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice week.